Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Jim Potter from McMaster University in uh, Ontario, Canada. Uh, today I want to talk about uh, a very large study that was done, so I'm going to just kind of give you the, uh, the brief overview. Um, but it was a study uh, we conducted with uh, Ford Motor Company, uh, and they were starting to use this digital human modeling process to uh, try to do proactive ergonomic assessments. Uh, and to their credit, started to ask questions about how valid. Sometimes you just want to put your head in the sand and just it's the only tool you have, so you don't want to know anything about the problems. But um, Allison Stevens came to us and said, well, what are the problems? Are we making valid decisions? Are we getting reliable results? So I'm mainly going to talk about the validity part of the study. There was a lot of sort of within and between subject variability analyses done as well. Um, and people are usually thrilled to see those results, but uh, we'll, we'll just stick to the validity stuff. Uh, and I had a number of colleagues as well, both uh, in my lab at the time I was at the University of Windsor, as well as uh, people at, uh, at Ford. So uh, I'm sort of preaching to the uh, converted here with this slide, but uh, basically we know that ergonomics can be used to assess the uh, injury risk associated with the job. Uh, and we've also come to learn that proactive assessments uh, can do that earlier and uh, much less uh, expensive. So at the time the study was done, which was about five years ago now, and we've sort of been carrying on uh, other studies, uh, but the main study was done about four or five years ago, the two main ways that this was done with, was with manual mannequin joint manipulation, or you'll see sometimes I think it says digital human mannequin manipulation. Uh, and we use the, cla the classic jack, so that, we'll call that the static method, and as well as starting to use motion capture. So the questions were, you know, do we need skilled workers as our subjects in motion capture? Uh, many times the engineers are put in there to try to, to teach them uh, firsthand that, this, that someone can't reach that antenna or that uh, windshield wiper. Uh, and uh, so, you know, what, and also what kind of props do we need to have in the lab when we do this? So the question was, uh, is the process that we have right now appropriate or, or are there things that we can do both to improve motion capture, to improve the process, uh, to increase the validity of the assumptions we make about a job now in terms of what it will become three years from now. Uh, and so the two methods we're going to look at is manual mannequin joint manipulation uh, and mocap. Uh, and again, we're looking at validity and reliability. Uh, and these were specific to automotive assembly tasks. So we tried to get a wide range of those tasks. So we went into both uh, an automotive and a truck plant. Uh, we had two sort of uh, workstations in each, uh, and there were three separate tasks within each workstation. So we had a total of 12 tasks, and I'll give you a, a visual idea of what that looked like. Uh, here you can see from the car plant, so a smaller vehicle. Uh, we tried to get uh, some in around waist chest height on the left, uh, which were uh, reach tasks, and then we also tried to get a number which were overhead tasks as well. And you can see that the forces, a lot of detail here, but the forces range from four newtons on one job, uh, just sort of putting a piece of adhesive on, to 89 newtons for an overhead task. Same sort of thing in the truck plant, uh, sort of reaching into the engine compartment on the left, three tasks, and also some overhead work with some fairly substantial reaches. So we wanted jobs that would have lots of options in terms of what someone would do, because typically coming out of these proactive assessments, you get one posture that you're going to assume is the posture. We want to see how close that was to what real workers would do. So the static, as I'll call it, uh, trials were done with six professional ergonomists and they typically will sit at a workstation and make guesses about what someone would do. So uh, at the time uh, they would position the Jack or Jill uh, mannequin uh, in what they thought was the appropriate position. So we want to know how consistent they were if we had them come back every month uh, and make these guesses and we wanted to know how consistent they were across each other in terms of their, what they all felt was the perfect guess uh, of how this would be done. Uh, and so they were given some general work instructions, uh, which would eventually be given to the workers. Uh, and what they were trying to do was get the person in a position that was realistic, but would also allow for the highest, because they're typically trying to get a posture that would allow for the highest force, uh, so that when they go to the suppliers, they now have sort of a limit that they can give them, but something that's realistic. So for the motion capture trials, we had 13 uh, operators, but these were operators that never saw the job that they were, they were going to come in and simulate. So we're going to call them, uh, uh, I forget what, untrained operators. So they're untrained on the job that they're going to be done. Uh, and we also had uh, 10 non-operators. So these were typically engineers and ergonomists 
uh, that had, again, never seen the job, but were going to try to guess what posture they would get into, but without the benefit of having years of experience uh, as a worker in an assembly plant. So uh, basically what we can see here is that, for example, with task one, uh, there would be three individuals that would be what we call the real workers. Uh, and so we'd go in and videotape them, and then we'd come back in and try to simulate those exact postures as close as we could, because we couldn't take the motion capture uh, systems out into the plants, or it was not feasible. So we, this was our absolute best simulation of exactly what these three workers, and there was quite a bit of variation in terms of how the real workers did the job. And then we had the untrained operators, and they would do it both crude, which was with minimal props. I mean, if you have to lean on something, you had to give them something to lean on, but otherwise, minimal props. And then as, as complicated a buck as we could set up in the, in the plant. I'll show you some pictures of that. And then we had the 10 non-operators. So we used a motion analysis system with 18 hot cameras and uh, sort of standard marker sets. Uh, subjects would see a projected image on the screen. Um, and you could see, obviously she can't see the one over her left, but there were two projected images so that they could, depending on which way they were facing, they could see it. Uh, and they would do five trials per task. So basically crude would be, all you, all you saw was the image. There was really nothing to guide you in terms of the posture, just you could, I mean, you would, there'd be collision detection if you were to run into a fender or something to tell you that you couldn't be in that position. Uh, and then we had some lift tables and things to set up some hard points uh, for, for, for Buck. Um, and we would try to um, at least provide them with some barriers and things just to see if that was important for the simulation. Uh, and then we had what we called uh, the real situation where we, for the real, uh, trying to get the real postures, we had as much of the parts in there as we could. So we, we had a pretty good idea of what people were really doing out of the plan. So the data analysis, uh, we, we looked at all three trials for the static because we wanted to know how much variability there was within a session, how much variability there was between sessions, and then be variability between uh, the ergonomists. Uh, we generally looked at the last three trials, give people a little bit of a chance in the first two to, to sort of find uh, what postures they wanted to get into. Now normally, and again this is a limitation, and Alice alluded to this, normally we sort of have the, the money shot where they insert the clip or put in the hose. So we looked at just the posture they were in when the forces were being applied. But there's lots of stuff that goes on in between and there's obviously a movement to, to sort of capture this dynamic uh, part of the trials. We used the Jack PLM software, um, and Ford has their own uh, ergonomic static strength prediction solver, which you see in the bottom right, you don't see much of it. But basically what it does is it's in real time showing you the uh, percent capables, and also for any given posture telling you the maximum force that would be acceptable, such that none of the joints exceeded uh, what 25, the 25th percentile female could do. So we basically uh, looked at every variable that was, uh, was in there. Uh, we looked at both kinematic variables, so shoulder posture in each of the three axes, trunk postures, uh, and we also looked at kinetic variables. The ones that were most important to us, because the shoulder ends up being limiting most of the time, uh, and many of the times, was the shoulder postures, and also from the kinetic point of view, uh, the percent capable, because that defines in Ford's system whether a job is green or red, whether it's acceptable or not acceptable. If 75% of females can't do it, it's, it's red. Uh, and we also looked at what the highest force was that was acceptable for that task, because that's the information that is filtered back to these suppliers. And so uh, we ran all types of statistics on all of these variables, but basically we went from what we felt was the sort of the most crude estimates, which was the static classic jack assessments with an ergonomist sitting at a workstation guessing, through to non-operators with buck and crude uh, situation to uh, the untrained operators, so people that do this for a living but not that particular task. And then we had what we felt was our gold standard, which was the, what the real workers did. And the theory was that probably the, the data would become more valid as we got more and more complex, but the hope was that it didn't have to be too complex, that maybe we could put engineers in there and maybe we didn't need to have full buck uh, to get valid results. So this just gives you an idea. So each different color and, and shape is a different joint. For example, the right elbow angle or the left trunk flex or the trunk flexion. And you can see that there's a fair bit of scatter here between the postures that we saw with the real workers and what we saw with the most crude estimates, the static jack assessment. Mm -hmm. This gets a little tighter if you look at the the top two or the un uh, the untrained operators. 
uh, both crude and buck, that's what C and B means, and then below crude and buck for the non-operators. Now, there's a fair bit of variability there, but there's also a fair bit of variability in what the real workers did. So not all workers are going to do it the exact same every time they do it, and not all workers are going to do it the same between each other. So this fell within a band of the variability that we'd see in reality. And also, the real important thing is not so much the postures, but what are the biomechanical and ergonomic implications of being in those postures. This was sort of the most important uh, data to me. So just to orient you, this is the percent capable. So basically, you wanted to make sure uh, that at least 75% of the people could do these jobs. Uh, for all of these jobs below, the, we would term these to be uh, unacceptable. Uh, this was each of the tasks. We just basically went from the one where the real worker had the highest percent capable to where the real worker had the lowest percent capable. And you can see this is what the static analysis gave us. Most of the time, the static analysis was higher because the ergonomists tend to get the people in the perfect posture, which is not necessarily what we see. <laughs> Uh, but they do, again, if I was to show you what each of these three wor real workers were doing, there was sort of a band of variability. So they generally were staying well within uh, what we saw in reality, and there were not many cases where different decisions would be made. This kind of uh, shows you what the decisions would be. So uh, basically, instead of, um, instead of plotting it for each task, uh, I'm, I'm plotting on the x-axis the real workers percent capable versus what the percent capable was uh, with uh, the different methods. So basically, if you're in this box here, you would make the false assumption using some of the other methods that the job was acceptable when it really wasn't. And if you were in this area, there were a few cases where you would say the job was unacceptable when it really was based on looking at real workers. So we didn't make any false positives. Uh, although we were, well, a few, we were sort of on the borderline. Uh, but you can see generally the decisions that got made would have been the same with the real workers and with the uh, different methods that were looked at. So I did a few scores basically taking some of the most important results uh, in terms of RMS errors, both for the kinetics and the joint angles, and I'll just show you a little bit of a summary of that. So if I take some of the most important measures and sort of get an average error, it kind of looks like what you'd expect. Sitting at a computer workstation trying to guess resulted in the highest errors when you pull some of the kinematic and kinetic variables. Uh, when you have the non-operators, you sort of have the next level of errors, but not a big difference between the crude and the buck, so it seems like you don't need a lot of physical props in there. Again, unless somebody needs to actually physically lean or there needs to be a step because you can't do that virtually. Uh, and then a little bit of an improvement when you went to the untrained operators. So just to kind of wrap this up then, uh, there was generally good agreement with real. There were very few cases where the wrong decision was made using some of these proactive methods, but there's still lots of room for improvement. There was a tendency for the static or digital mannequin manipulation methods to overestimate what would uh, be the per percentage of people that would be capable of doing the job when you compare it to what we saw in reality. So that's a bit of an issue. Uh, just as a side note, we've done a subsequent study from what we learned from the study to give the operators or the ergonomists some more rules, uh, and we do see an improvement based on what we learned, but there's still some issues. There's still some jobs, some complex overhead and long-reaching jobs, and probably the ergonomists aren't going to be able to guess. You probably need motion capture, or hopefully even further in the future, posture prediction. Um, and some of those things were, for example, uh, we didn't monitor neck flexion in this study, and we found that that's an important variable for overhead work. Uh, it was adequate for many of the tasks, but again, for the more complex tasks, you need something better to drive the postures. Uh, for the most part, the non-operators were uh, generally sufficient as subjects. There were a few cases where they couldn't guess what uh, the, un the uh, untrained workers could. Uh, and there was really no need for elaborate uh, props and buck. You can get some very simple props in there uh, in the cases where you absolutely, absolutely need to lean against something or brace against something. So I'd like to thank Ford Motor Company for sort of having the foresight to do a study like this and I guess the bravery because sometimes uh, if this had turned out poorly it would it really messed up the process that they had. Uh, and also thank uh, all of the people that actually did the, the hard work in the lab which is typically the graduate students. Thank you very much.
Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. We used, uh, at the time, I think it was the 50th percentile, because uh, we these weren't studies to look at reach and So once they decide that the reach and the hand clearance is sufficient, then I believe the 50th percentile female was used at the time uh, for those assessments. There's more of a move now to, to have more of a breadth of uh, anatomies that are, or anthropometries that are tested uh, within those assessments. And what was the size range of the folks that you had? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question because uh, as Allison alluded to, a fifth percentile automotive worker is, not, is bigger than a fifth percentile North American. Uh, and one of the things that messed us up in the study is we used fifth percentile females or 50th percentile females for the overhead work. Uh, but actually the women that do overhead work in an automotive assembly plant are more like 75th and 80th percentile. So there's a bit of a natural selection that goes on out there. So we actually went back and reassessed it with the larger anthropometries and we got more valid results than what I'm showing here. So, um, you know, the question is, do you analyze it for the population that generically we say we're designing for, or do we accept the fact that natural selection occurs and there probably aren't fifth percentile females putting antennas on navigators uh, on, the, on the middle line? So that, I mean, all of that still needs to be evaluated. Yeah. You said that um, the ergonomists often made a number of uh, mistakes in their predictions. Did you find a trend in that kind of thing? That you sort of touched on it that you know you, you increase the number of questions and so forth that you do. Yeah, so for example, one of them was uh, when real workers do work overhead, uh, it, when an ergonomist analyzes it, they get the hand right here because then you can apply a huge force because there's no moment about the shoulder, but of course your neck is in an extended position. What we found is real workers don't do that. They will risk a little bit at the shoulder so that the neck does not go into, let's say, more than 10 degrees extension. So in the second study we did, we limited Jack to 10 degrees of neck extension, which forced the ergonomist, they had no choice, they had to put the person back further, and we got more valid joint postures, more valid soft forces. So that was one of the big ones. The other one was use people of the actual anthropometries of the type of people that are being uh, used for those jobs. For, so for maybe overhead work, maybe use 75th percentile female uh, in there instead of 50th because that's the type of people that do overhead work. So when we implemented that, it didn't make it perfect, but there were a lot more jobs that we made good decisions on uh, than we had in the previous. But on that point, do you have any concern that you say it's natural selection because of the work, but is it also possibly natural, natural selection because of the limitation of the work? And maybe by making it uh, closer to the main population, will increase the number of, in this case, women who can actually do the work. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I mean, if, if the job was designed to a 50th percentile female could do it, then you might not need the, the natural selection. The selection would shift. Exactly, yeah. And the risk would go down Correct. forever. For the entire population. Yeah, which is what you want. Thank you very much. Okay.